Dr. Michael Burry was one of the first investors to really understand the potential with GameStop stock. His first investment in GameStop dates back all the way back to February 2019 when it first appeared as a holding in Scion Asset Management's 13F filing. However, despite his early research, it appears that Michael Burry has now completely sold out of his GameStop position at the end of 2020, meaning that he has missed the short squeeze that occurred in January of 2020. So in this video, we'll be taking a look at his investment portfolio at the time and what he was buying instead. So this is the 13F filing of Michael Burry's Cyan Asset Management as of the end of 2020. In the 13F filing, we can see all of the open stock positions in Michael Burry's portfolio, as well as his call and put options. And unfortunately, we don't see any short positions because those are not required to be disclosed on 13F filings. However, we can at least see how much is invested in each of these assets, as well as any changes compared to the prior quarter. Up here at the top, I built a little automated highlighting tool, which will help us break down the portfolio into different subsections to understand Burry's reasoning, potentially on some of these investments. First off, we'll take a look at the top 50%, or the investments that comprise more than half of his portfolio. In this case, the top three largest portfolio holdings are Citigroup, Pfizer, and Kraft Heinz Company, and these are all not stock positions, but they're actually call option positions. Call options are generally more risky than owning a stock outright, and they bet on the stock price increasing by a certain point in time. Call options currently make up roughly 38% of his portfolio as of filing, but that's actually down from prior quarters where he had previously invested in a lot more call options on various companies. His next two positions, Lumen Technology and Now Incorporated, make up roughly about 5% of the portfolio each, followed by RPT Realty, which makes up about 4% of the portfolio. And of those top positions, it's worth pointing out that both Citigroup, Kraft Heinz, as well as Now Incorporated are all new positions added to the portfolio as of the most recent quarter. Other new positions added to Burry's portfolio between October and December of 2020 include Wells Fargo, The Geo Group, Molson Coors Beverage, Coors Civic, Holly Frontier Corporation, Ingalls Market, Suncoke Energy, and Aries Capital Corporation. So put another way, about half of his current positions are positions that are new and were initiated in the last three months. And while Burry did add 11 new positions in this quarter, he also sold out of his stake in 21 positions from the previous quarter as well. And if you followed Burry's portfolio for some time, this isn't something that's too surprising as he does have a relatively high level of portfolio turnover. Meaning that unlike traditional buy and hold investors who typically hold for longer durations of time, at least a year, it doesn't appear that Michael Burry has any hesitation when it comes to selling a position if he sees an opportunity that appears more attractive to him. And one of those positions that Burry sold was actually GameStop stock. And this is interesting because Burry was one of the first investors to see the potential for GameStop as an undervalued, really a deep value stock that had the potential to benefit from the cyclical console cycle, as well as a potential transition in the future. Now, I first purchased GameStop shares myself in my own portfolio back in 2018. So when I heard that Burry had an initiated position in his portfolio in 2019, that was exciting news, at least as a shareholder. As someone who's been following GameStop stock over the last three years or so, I can say that most investors who invested between 2018 and 2020 did so on the fundamental thesis. They believed the business was undervalued based on fundamentals of the company. With an upcoming console cycle, the new cash flows could be used to rejuvenate the company, as well as potentially fund a transition to a more digital and e-commerce focused business. Given the extremely high short interest over 100% of float, a short squeeze was always a possibility, but it never was the primary driving factor for most of these investors, though it did present the potential opportunity for asymmetric upside if a short squeeze were to occur. And a short squeeze ended up being exactly what happened in January of 2021, when GameStop stock exceeded $400 per share and likely would have gone significantly higher if brokerages didn't step in and restrict retail buying. Now looking at GameStop stock's price chart, the highest it traded in 2020 was I think roughly around $24, but then closed around 20 and ended the year at roughly 19. So my best guess is that Michael Burry liquidated his GameStop position for about $20 per share. Had he held on, he would have had the potential to sell his shares 
for over 16 times what he sold them for if he sold during the peak of the short squeeze. Even if he held onto those shares through February of 2021, they would still be worth double what he likely sold them for. So was this a mistake by Michael Burry? Well, in hindsight, you could arguably say yes. By selling out early, he missed the asymmetric opportunity of a short squeeze, which honestly likely will be the only one of this magnitude that we'll see in our lives. No other company I've seen has had such a high short interest as a percentage of float, where more shares were shorted than actually existed in the market, creating the ultimate melt-up scenario for short sellers. On the other hand, Burry likely purchased most of his position at a cost basis at or under $5 per share. If he did so, his sale represented a 300% return or quadrupling his money in just over a year. Those are fantastic returns on their own, so it's hard to blame him for taking a profit. In fact, there's a good quote from his 2001 shareholder letter, which he says, I certainly have proven no ability to pick tops, and I do not anticipate attempting such a feat in the future. With that in mind, Burry selling out of his GameStop position doesn't seem too out of line with his investment philosophy. For Michael Burry, he makes most of his money buying undervalued stocks when they're relatively cheap, and then selling them when they're at a fair value. In this case, he likely misses some of the potential upside if his stock continues to run potentially above fair value, but that's not how he invests. And while Burry did trim out his GameStop position, the portfolio hasn't suffered entirely. Burry's portfolio in 2021 has done quite well up to this point, up 14% compared to 5% increase in the S&P 500 over that same period in time. Some of his best performing positions over that period include Now Incorporated, Discovery Communications, and Designer Brands. If we take a look at the portfolio return by holding, you can see that those three components make up about 6% of that total 14% return. But most of his positions, at least over these last month and a half, are up and are contributors to the total gain in the portfolio. Now, if you're a long-term investor like myself, you really shouldn't worry too much about day-to-day, week-to-week, or even month-to-month -month variations in the prices of your portfolio holdings. These short-term price movements will likely just end up being noise in the long run, so you shouldn't get too excited or too disappointed if you see a price increase or decrease in the short term. Now, Burry by nature is a contrarian investor betting against the crowd, and a lot of his investments have that philosophy with them. It are what I'd likely call deep value stocks or deep value investments that are trading at depressed valuations for some reason or another. Discovery is one such company, which in 2020 at one point was trading at single digit price to earnings multiples. For most of 2020, there were opportunities to buy the stock at $20 per share, as many investors were still uncertain about the future of the business. However, for investors who saw the potential value of Discovery's media assets and their potential as a streaming service, well, they got an opportunity to buy a cheaply valued stock, which had options and room for future growth. And when it comes to contrarian investments and deep value, I can probably think of few others that fit that category more than private prisons. Now, investing in private prisons is sometimes a controversial decision for investment managers, but Michael Burry seems to have no qualms if he believes the assets are cheap. In this case, he's taking a 3% position each or 6% of his portfolio in total to invest in the two largest private prison operators in the United States that being the Geo Group and Core Civic. Looking at the stock price of both Geo Group and Core Civic, both are trading at decade low prices. Now, if there's one certainty when it comes to private prisons is political uncertainty, especially when it comes to potential contracts in the future and usage trends over time. That being said, Michael Burry may believe that at these low prices, most of that negative uncertainty is already priced into the stock, meaning that from here on out, there's more likely a better chance of potential upside compared to downside risk. Whether that plays out in the political environment going forward is yet to be seen. However, it's interesting to note that during the Democratic presidential administration from 2008 to 2016, both the business fundamentals and stock price for both Geo Group and CoreCivic did quite well during that period in time, despite the uncertainties surrounding the use of private prisons still being present during those times as well. Oftentimes you don't get exceptionally low prices for no reason, and there's certainly uncertainties with these two companies. That being said, it's clear Burry thinks that these stocks are undervalued, at least in the short term. Another thing that's interesting about Burry's portfolio this quarter, which is a bit different from previous quarters that we've seen with Michael Burry, 
is that his portfolio appears much more evenly diversified across various investments compared to his typically concentrated approach. While he still maintains a certain degree of concentration with his three option call positions, making up roughly 38% of the portfolio, Aside from that, his remaining stock positions make up no more than 5% of the portfolio each, and most of them are relatively evenly split and weighted at around 3-4% to of the portfolio each. There are certain benefits and drawbacks to having a higher level of portfolio concentration versus a more diversified portfolio. For a diversified portfolio of individual stocks, no one stock is really going to move the needle as much compared to if you had a more concentrated position in that individual stock. The more concentrated you are, naturally the more your portfolio performance will be gravitating towards the performance of your concentrated positions. This can help increase portfolio performance when those concentrated positions do well, but the inverse applies too, so when those positions aren't doing so hot relative to the market, then your performance of your total portfolio will likely lag. Regarding sector concentration, relative to the S&P 500, Burry is more concentrated in financials, consumer staples, real estate, and energy relative to the index. His allocation to the information technology sector is only at roughly 4% of his portfolio compared to the index weighting currently at around 22%. Given this, Burry's portfolio will likely see a positive benefit from rising interest rates in the future, which should benefit financials. On the other hand, if interest rates remain low, we could continue to see elevated valuation levels for many tech stocks, where much of that valuation is based on expectations for future growth discounted at a lower interest rate. In that scenario, Burry's 4% weighting to tech might be a bit underexposed, though this is a calculated risk he's likely considered. Overall, Burry's portfolio definitely looks like a portfolio of a value investor. Now, the only stock in his portfolio that I actually own currently is Aries Capital Corporation, currently the smallest portfolio position in Burry's portfolio at just about 1% of the portfolio. Aries Capital is a business development company and they provide loans to middle market private companies that may not have access to capital markets as larger corporations do. Investors in ARK and most business development companies don't look for share price appreciation as the way to get returns, although if you buy at a low enough price, you can achieve that. The main way investors in companies like ARK make money is through the dividend payments that are passed on to shareholders. In this case, ARK is currently paying roughly a 9% dividend yield, which is quite high, but there are risks involved. Should those underlying businesses have issue paying back their loans, you could see loan write-offs or loan losses, which would impact the underlying loan portfolio that Aries Capital has. From the stock price chart, you can see that there was a lot of uncertainty back during March of 2020, when it was unsure whether these companies would have the ability to pay back these loans. Prices dropped as low as $8. I remember making my initial purchase around between $10 and $12 per share. The logic being at the time that at those lower prices, much of the loan losses may already be priced into the stock, and so even if some companies are unable to pay back, the value of the remaining loans and that interest cash flow should be higher than that $10 to $12 per share. Perhaps Michael Burry was thinking this as well, or perhaps he noticed the always encouraging sign of insider buying by the chief executive. In this case, on August 28, 2020, the CEO bought over a million dollars worth of shares. Now, insiders might sell for a variety of reasons, but they buy for only one, and that's because they think the stock price will go up in the future and is currently undervalued. In the past, Burry's portfolio could potentially be summed up in several themes, perhaps beaten down retail stocks or a leveraged bet on Google call options. In the case for Burry's portfolio at the end of 2020, it's the most diversified portfolio I've seen from Burry in a long time. So I can't really characterize it in the sense of a single investment theme, but I think overall you could characterize it as a diversified deep value portfolio of contrarian bets. As always, it'll be interesting to see the portfolio developments each quarter to quarter as Burry reassesses these investments and potential future opportunities. So let me know your thoughts on his portfolio or any of his stock holdings in the comments below. And I know I've been less than consistent on my upload schedule, but if you'd like to be notified of when I do upload, subscribing with notifications on is the best way to do that. Until then, thank you so much for watching. My name is Michael, and I will see you in the next video.